Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Genova Burns. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Healthcare 2016, Obamacare, insurance companies, urgent care centers, ACOs. What's happening? Insurance companies leaving exchanges. I don't know the answer. So today I assembled this group of dynamic healthcare leaders to provide their insight on Healthcare 2016. My guests include Dr. Andrew Brotman, who's the senior vice president. Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs and Strategy at the NYU Langone Medical Center. Arthur Klein, who is the president of the Mount Sinai Health Network. Dr. Andrew Racine, who is the chief medical officer of the Montefiore Medical System. Health System. Health System. So, you know, you used to be a Bronx boy only, but then, you've, then you expanded because part of healthcare is to expand. Now you're in Westchester. You, you're the 800-pound gorilla, okay? You have all of these facilities. I passed Mount Sinai, Queens. Then you have Brooklyn. And you, you, you know, in your quiet little way, you know, you guys are opening up with Lutheran and other things. And then these Article 28s like the Tisch Health Center, you know, on Fifth Avenue. So where do you see 2016, especially when we read in the newspapers that the exchanges, you know, Health Republic and United Healthcare are leaving? Where do you see this for reimbursement and operational? Well, I think your opening was uh, on point. I think the answer is we don't know. And we are trying to navigate an environment that is unknowable. Uh, there are some things that are clear. The inexorable, inexorable move uh, to ambulatory care from inpatient, uh, greater access uh, uh, to patients in uh, facilities and environments that are less structured uh, uh, is happening, both because of technological reasons and because of uh, economic uh, uh, reasons. How that ultimately fits in to an overall system and whether we uh, move profoundly into population health management or not. Uh, some people think that's a, an answered question and we're going there. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and I think you need to be prepared for all eventuality. When you bring that out, one of the, the leaders, okay, is Montefiore and the population health management. I mean, you've been around with the ACO uh, concept since 1965. How do you see that today? And explain to my audience what the ACO concept is. Sure. Because people think, you know, you go to the doctor, how do they get reimbursed? People aren't aware that you want to keep people healthy and you want to reduce the amount of examinations and tests. Right. Well, let me begin by agreeing exactly with 
with what Dr. Brotman is saying because I still think there's a fair amount of uncertainty in the entire healthcare sector. My own view about what's happening with regard to the exchanges and people bouncing in and out is that this is simply a pricing issue. Um, no one is quite certain about the right market price for this product and as a result, being risk averse, they're going to stand back and see what happens. But ultimately, when we know who are in these exchanges and who aren't, and we know a little bit more about them, those price variations and fluctuations are going to settle down, people are going to be able to intelligently price their product, and people who may now say they're going to be out, they'll be back in. I'm, I'm, you know, this is something that uh, there's a way for uh, intelligent insurance companies to make money in the exchanges. I believe they'll eventually do it. The issue about the ACO, though, is a really interesting one, and I think it grows out of the experience that we've had in Montefiore living in the Bronx and working in the Bronx. And it has long been the case that we're an institution that believes, on the basis of our empirical experience, that most people's, um, uh, if you will, experience with health and with illness grows out of what's going on in their lives in general. And if you're going to be able to control that, you have to have some information about other aspects of their lives. And that really means being able to take uh, advantage of um, information about what people are doing in general and being able to work with that. To do that intelligently, in our mind, will allow you to take risk for what's going to happen with them eventually. If you know enough about people and you have enough experience in interacting with other parts of their lives, you can actually keep them healthy. And now, doesn't hospital. the government compensate you if you have a good ACO? So the way the ACO works is essentially it's, um, a, it's a contract with the government that allows you to take risk on patients. And what the government essentially says is the following. Um, we're going to attribute a certain number of patients to your system on the basis of their past utilization. Um, we'll sort of talk a little bit about whether that attribution is right. Once we agree about who you're responsible for, you are going to try to manage the costs of those patients over time. We're going to also construct another cadre of patients that look exactly like yours, but are not. They're just sort of out there. And we're going to track the costs of caring for those patients over time. And if you, with your cadre, manage to come in at a cost that's lower than what that comparable population is, we'll split the difference with you in those savings. And if so, so you know, it's if cost you, sharing. Yes, it's exactly what it is. It's cost sharing. That's exactly what it is. And so you have to be willing to say, yeah, we think we can do this on the basis of our previous experience. Let's go ahead and try it. But let's look at healthcare 2016. You know, you're building a hospital, you're changing your facilities and all the rest. And at one time, someone would go to the hospital and the average number of days were four or five days. The average day today is what? Well, at, at, at our place, it's, it's 3.9 for everything. And we're pretty close everything to that old. in Mount Sinai. 3.9. But let, let's look at the old days, okay? And let's look at the, the, the surgery, you know, that surgery center. We're talking day surgery. I mean, I think you've done it, and I, I'm certain that all of you have been pretty close to getting people out with hip replacements in a day and a half today, which is unusual. This was, you know, hip replacements yeah. was a long time. 16 hours. And, and it, I mean, there's no question that uh, uh, things are moving to the uh, ambulatory sphere. I think there's also no question, as Dr. Racine says, that there is a move for uh, health care deliverers to take on more risk. And I think the question is, how do you best do that? So, so, what kind of infrastructure? So, so, what so kind of data? have this question. You know, take on more risk. You could, you could become like North Shore LIJ or whatever they're calling themselves now, taking the risk of being an insurance company. But, but Mike, I want to give you kind of an opposite perspective to that. And I think the commonality, and I agree with everything my colleagues have said, the commonality of the three of us in this room is we all represent highly evolved academic medical centers. And the piece of health care which the public frequently forgets, which the government frequently forgets, is just like we're trying to deal with new paradigms of health care delivery, being more efficient, getting patients out of the hospital, getting them to safer environments, more ambulatory care, we're also, each of us, heavily invested in new technologies, heavily invested in new investigations. And so we're trying to change health care in two ways. We're trying to be more efficient and responsive deliverers of healthcare, given what we know about healthcare delivery today. At the same time, each of us leads institutions that are at the forefront 
of new discoveries, new technologies. Right. And the unpredictability when you talk about healthcare, whether it's 2016 or 2020, is what technologies are going to govern what we do? What what, uh, drug innovations uh, are going to change things? We now, we used to talk about uh, genetics. Now we talk about precision medicine, custom designed drugs. And, and while you say that we're getting patients out of the hospital faster, I would also argue that we're dealing with sicker and sicker patients all the time. Lifespans are increasing. The number of interventions we consider safe as people have advanced disease or advanced age is increasing. And we have to balance both of those equations. Yeah, if we walk around the city of New York or any part of the country, we see all of a sudden these urgent care centers. I remember at one time, and it was something that you weren't part of, but it you know, was a Beth Israel continuum. They were the first that they were in the Duane Reed. Mm-hmm. Okay, but they were, you know, it, was, it wasn't a full facility. It was a small dock in the box, you know, who would be able to dispense and really there were no x-rays. Now we have 125 with at least 55 in various stages of development in the city. Some of the leasing brokers have said to me, the, the biggest tenant is the chop salad store and the city MD. And, you know, they've replaced Starbucks. They've st- replaced Starbucks. I was I saw an owner at a holiday party the other day. I said, who are you putting in? This is on 50th Street and 2nd Avenue. He said, oh, I just put another city MD in. I said, there's a guy across the street. I mean, where do you see that in your operations, the urgent care center, the other dynamic situation of where people are utilizing the the skyping to sh- to discuss patients or the you know to uh, you know somebody has a bad cold or something instead of going anywhere even to the urgent care center the idea of skyping it and getting the prescription where do you see this in your system your system and so on? you know the urgent care center and we have uh, a couple and a relationship with others is incredibly convenient for the consumer who has the type of uh, illness. If you want a flu shot, if you uh, hurt yourself uh, uh, marginally, if you're uh, ill, it, it is uh, it's extremely convenient to go to an urgent care center. Uh, whether that model survives or not depends on how the rest of the system survives. What concerns me about the model is that most of those systems are not connected to the rest of the health system. So it is quite possible. Right, they're for, not part of Epic. It, it, they don't have the medical records of all the uh, exactly. situations. So you can go to you know four different places in two days, and none of the other three have any idea of what happened, except if you uh, if you tell them. I think that will change. I think these these systems will begin to join uh, the rest of the system at some point. We'll have better interoperability of the electronic health records, which right now really is still poor, and uh, and and there will be uh, an evolution. But Arthur, so I th- I agree with Andy. I think we would all agree that basically volume driven transactional medicine at this point in time that appeals to generational changes and demographic changes we see in our city, but we have to figure out a way. It's incumbent to figure out a way upon us to figure out a way to bring them into our systems because there's a reality. They are seeing millions of patients, and that's undeniable. I think their economic model... They can be a revenue source because they can generate patients the same way that you have uh, hospitals in Brooklyn and you have Lutheran over there that certain cases that you're going to bring them back to the mothership. The, the, The tertiary hospital can handle certain things hey, I, with I Westchester. Think, no, I, mean, I, I think you're right. I, I think, but uh, getting back originally to Dr. Brotman's original point, we don't know. We don't know how these things are going to evolve over time. It's a continuum of how um, people are going to want to purchase convenience, which is essentially what's being purchased here. And right now, it may be more convenient to go to an urgent care center. Tomorrow, it's going to be more convenient to go to CVS because they can do it at less expense than the urgent care center. They don't have the same fixed costs. After that, it's going to be more convenient to call somebody up on the phone. And for so much of what people are using these centers for, that evolution is going to continue over time. And but where it ends and how is not something that I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, about a year ago, I, I, I fell, and I thought I had 
torn ligament or something like that. And I was going to go to the urgent care center, and I said, you know what, they don't have all of the, the, the uh, diagnostic x-rays, so I'm going there, it's a step gap, I'm not going to accomplish. So I did go to the emergency room because it was more of efficient as opposed to making a couple of stops. Well, that, that's part of the issue. Uh, I mean, but it was a determination the, in my mind the, because the I was a, maybe a smarter consumer. Yes, the consumer than, has to be quite educated as to what right. level of care uh, they uh, they may need. Uh, uh, an urgent care center doesn't need an MRI. 98% of people don't need an MRI, so you'll probably... Coupled, be right, but coupled with the insurance wrong. company is not yes. going to pay because they <laughs> to get an MRI, you have to get approved first. But, but the flip side is... Let's say you had a sore throat and you're going to take a business trip tomorrow. You either don't have a primary care doctor or your primary care doctor's office is closed. You've just left work and you want to make some decisions about travel, antibiotics, etc. They're a very convenient way and you're likely to get good care. The problem is, and I think these are all turned into economic decisions we have to make and, and calculi we have to do, it's, uh, it's a question right now. They save money from the emergency room visit when, when it's inappropriate to go to an emergency room. But the flip side of that equation is their expensive primary care when a family doctor or primary care doctor could answer the same questions the, the and is likely to be reimbursed the, the less. The co-cure, there was an article saying that before they had an affiliation, they weren't able to negotiate with insurance companies. So they were seeing patients and eating up the loss because they didn't have a reimbursement schedule. They didn't have a, an affiliation tie. My experience in having worked with several of them, as we all are, is that they have less problem getting commercial insurance uh, rates, and they generally need to be part of systems in the Medicaid sphere. So I think the article may have misstated that a little bit, Mike. And many of them, as a result, don't take Medicaid uh, government uh, payments. So they don't take Medicare and Medicaid? Sometimes. Sometimes. So, so here, here's the question. Another phenomenon, I was at a friend's office the other day, and one of my neighbors said to me, is the concierge. What is this idea of the concierge doctor? Okay, you know, you, you have the benefit. I, I can't, they, they're no longer in the system. I don't want to see you. How do you see the concierge doctor? I think it's, as we all deal with a very unusual uh, healthcare delivery model in this this part of the world. It's something that doesn't exist in most other localities with any vibrancy, if you would. There are certain people who want to pay again for health care when they want it, want immediate access to the doctor that they choose. But is, you know, the, 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 I think that's a misnomer because the concierge saying, I'm limiting my number of patients, it's not saying I have this, if too many of those patients all have a condition at the same time. That person is one human being or a small group. I don't see it working Well, the out. concierge is a single-person insurance company right? who basically says, pay me a certain amount of money. I will decide how many I can handle. That's a guess. That's a bet. If I get overwhelmed, I'm in trouble uh, uh, otherwise. Well, except and, uh, right, except they're not on the hook for the real costs. They're right. not on Imaging, the, drugs, they're not on the hook hospitalization, for the real and, ER visits. That's correct. And they right. also don't necessarily give the care themselves. A good deal of the concierge model is, Navigate. I'll personally make the appointment for you with the orthopedist. Right. I'll make sure you get into the rheumatologist I like or the cardiologist I like. That's a big part of it. They, they act as a major d, not just as a healthcare care deliverer themselves. I think, I think one of the big issues about cost being the leading issue is what do you do where, and, and three quick examples, we can now cure hepatitis C. Uh, Jimmy Carter just said he doesn't have uh, cancer anymore through immunotherapy. And we can now stick heart valves in through the vasculature and get people out of the hospital in three days, but that valve costs $32,000. And I guess part of people will say, well, but that's such a small part of the population, we can handle that cost. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. How do we deal with uh, uh, real improvement of care, uh, but high cost technology in, in an environment? What where about this new pro the proton center? I mean, how much is that going to cost? 
right? This is something you're building this facility. I, you know, the number of the hospital are partners in the situation. You know, I don't. I'm not aware of what the reimbursement level is, but you know, it's a very expensive proposition. It, it, it is. A, a proton center, uh, arguably there are other uh, approaches that can uh, help. But this hepatitis drug, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's That's a exactly miracle. Correct. And, uh, and, and immunotherapy, let, let's see, I'm not sure we know, but it has the chance of really having an impact. And these things are hugely expensive. Advertising today, you turn on the television, you turn on the radio, healthcare is one of the biggest advertisers, healthcare and the pharmaceutical companies. So the question comes in that people say to me, oh, uh, pneumonia? Forget the flu. The flu is nothing. I mean, that's a, that's a baby thing. You know, do I take a shot for pneumonia? Do I take a shot uh, for... Um, uh, meningitis. Not meningitis. The other... Uh, Zoster. Right, you know, the, the, the one shingles. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, right. Yeah. right, so, you know, I, I've had shingles. I've had it twice, okay? The, the question is, you know, part of it's driven by the commercials on, on TV that the pharmaceutical companies are, are driving this. And part of it is you see all of the systems and, you know, you pick up the Sunday New York Times where they used to have more real estate ads. I see more ads from every one of the systems sitting here and the rest of them. You know, do we see more of that? I mean, and we were discussing, what's the value? What, what, is, what is NYU with the Made in New York, which I think is a very creative ad program, okay? And uh, the Mount Sinai and the Montefiore. What do you see, and, and, and you're a big advertiser up in the Bronx, and that's your market. Where do you see the, the role of advertising? The people, when they're saying, I have cancer, and the one thing, one cancer center is these guys out of Philadelphia, who I, uh, which cancer really, centers the of cancer America. centers of America, they are getting that middle America person saying, oh, they are good. Now, somebody like myself who understands they have no affiliation with anyone, and I don't know the credentialing of these doctors, but middle America hears this ad. So that's a complex question, and I mean, I think each of us would approach it a little bit differently simply because every advertising campaign has different drivers. It may be that you're looking to enhance your national reputation because scores in U.S. News and World Report and other national accreditation or national survey instruments are important. It may be because you're keeping up with the competition, so you may not be the initiator, but you don't also want to be the not running person. It may be because, and I have this, I'm sure my colleagues do too, every time we recruit star talent, the first thing they ask is, what's the budget to promote me? Aren't you going to advertise me? So there's an expectation of that. You, Sometimes you've you changed... Know something you bring up something interesting, but I, with all the advertising that I see, with the exception perhaps of one of the, your doctors, okay, the heart doctor, I haven't seen too much on advertising specific doctors. I've seen the advertising with regard to different services and different lines, but I haven't seen the doctor ads. Well, I really. think implicit in some they of the use, service lines know, is, is promoting a new doctor who's bringing a new service in. But um, it, 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 is, it is a complex environment, and it does eat up a lot of money. I think, the, I think the predominant reason for systems like ours to do it is brand recognition and reputational status as opposed to getting patients right. uh, through, through uh, advertising. I think that uh, reputational status is increasingly important, and we are also playing to our constituencies, our own doctors, if they see the others advertising exactly. and we don't. Your get board upset. of trustees. Our board of trustees gets very uh, upset or pleased, uh, depending on one's reputational status. And, uh, and I did one other thing, which is sometimes, as with our current advertising campaign, it's a way of announcing to a very broad public what, why we envision becoming a healthcare system and some of the things we like no, to I, stand for. Look, you, you, you took a large merger, so 
you have a specific model and you're trying to show the the conglomeration of all the hospitals exactly. and the staff and the doctors. So you're trying to get a message across at a certain time. You did, uh, I think part of it was after Sandy and part of it was right. the situation. Montefiore, you know, is the Bronx, but also showing the day care, the ambulatory care surgery center, the affiliations up in Westchester. I think that's part of the situation. Speaking about affiliations, do you see more and more, I'm not specifically, this is a generic question as opposed to a specific question. Do you see more and more mergers perhaps taking place in, the 20, in 2016 and 2020? I call it consolidation. I see more and more consolidation, whether it's in the form of merger or part of a clinically integrated network or part of an ACO or part of something like that, more and more consolidation. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that there are areas in greater New York uh, where there's, you know, real concern. Uh, will the music stop and there won't be a chair to sit in and will there be the proper distribution of health care within the city to take care of the people who live there? I think everyone feels a little bit more comfortable being under some tent today, given all the uncertainties, because each of us is echoed. We really don't know what the answers are. And I think the other thing is that uh, our large systems have become a proxy for the state being unable to take over some of the responsibilities of failing or problematic institutions. And there is an expectation that the healthy, vibrant systems take some of that responsibility on. Where do you see, I mean, you, you went to Westchester, which is not far from your geographical neighborhood. Do you see yourself going, because I remember when Arthur was on the show a couple of years ago and with, with Tony, uh, Tony uh, Ferreri, you know, you went after the same hospitals that you were trying to go after to increase uh, do you see yourself going? I think the issue for us is less hospitals than it is patient population. I mean, we are trying to get to a million covered lives, which is really what we think is the size of an institutional uh, footprint that we're going to be looking for. And the communities that we are investing in in that regard in Westchester actually are very similar to some of the people that we've already been taking care of in the Bronx. So it's really not so much the hospital here or hospital there. It's really more... And so you're, the, you're the talking about patient care. lives. Yep. And what about, you know, um, uh, I just read that uh, North Shore is the, the largest employer in the state of New York today. Do you see um, <clears throat> more of the Long Island hospitals being taken over or affiliations with your hospitals? Uh, absolutely. Again, not necessarily mergers or, or acquisitions, but uh, g groups of providers seeking lives, as you described, and trying to work together to manage them as best as they can will continue to happen. Uh, uh, it'll definitely happen in Suffolk, the, the, the rest of Nassau County, and uh, uh, Brooklyn will continue and, over the next year. And when you've got a very large system like North Shore, it, it perforce makes other hospitals think, well, do I belong in that system? What, am I, what other partnerships help me survive? So it becomes basically a market changer. What about the, the national exposure of a, like the Cleveland Clinic affiliate, having an affiliation or certain type of programs with hospitals here? Do you see yourself? You have the, the uh, National Denver Hospital idea. Where is that? Well, that's a very academic affiliation, and I think we all come from culti <clears throat> cultures where we like to share academic talent, intellectual talent, and that's what's a driver of that relationship. So, so what we're going to do next year is probably invite you back and see if our discussion continued and where, the, where it really took place. You'll probably be able to find us all in a drugstore right. uh, 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 trying to uh, uh, attract people and uh, giving them care <laughs> at a storefront. Absolutely. I don't, I don't think that for the people out here. I'd like to thank Andy, Arthur and Andy, and I'll see you next week.